Good morning, colleagues. Uh, my name is Tony McKay, and I have the privilege to moderate what I know will be a very exciting panel. Welcome to you all, and thank you for joining this debate this morning on education and society, listening to learners. And you will have seen from the background information that this is the opportunity for us, I think, to put the spotlight on exactly what the opening session referred to this morning, and that is the central place of learners. And of course, this morning we had the opportunity of celebrating Wise Learners 2012. Um, and we're delighted that one of our panel members is indeed a wise learner, but I'll come to that in a moment. <laughs> but feel free to. <laughs> Let me just set the context of the debate prior to asking each of our panel members to introduce themselves. They did not trust me to introduce them. So I will make sure they introduce themselves. But can we be clear that in this morning's debate, we are wanting to think about the importance of being a 21st century learner with the kind of skills that you need in this century in all countries, in all jurisdictions. Uh, increasingly, we're talking about global skills and in particular about the importance of being a global citizen and a global leader. So we are wanting to put the focus on young people themselves, the importance of becoming an active and informed citizen, the challenges that we face for education and for our schools because, of course, young people have the opportunity to express themselves in both formal and informal settings and increasingly through the power and reach of social media. And we are wanting to put the spotlight on citizenship and the role that schools play in ensuring that we have citizenship education that enables all young people to participate fully in their societies and globally. Hence the importance of this morning's dual title, education and society, listening to learners. The process that we're going to use is that we'll tackle the debate in three parts. And in each part, I'm going to ask our panel members to make opening comments. And then I'm going to invite you to participate through your comments or your questions and Twitter questions that I also receive. So colleagues, that's the approach that we're going to take. And I'm going to invite each panel member to briefly introduce themselves. So Martha, please do so. Hello everyone, my name is Martha Kimweri, a graduate of law from Tumain University in Tanzania. I'm currently a recruitment consultant at Rada Recruitment Agent based in Tanzania. I'm also doing my master's in human resource management and I'm part of the Learner's Voice program under the Qatar Foundation. Thank you, Martha. We'll just greet you again with the same level of enthusiasm that we had before. So thank you for joining us. Jacek, welcome. Jacek Strzemieczny from Poland, Warsaw. Uh, 20 years ago, I established a non-governmental organization, uh, Center for Citizenship Education, and now I am president of it. Thank you very much indeed. And welcome. Ayo. Oh. Uh, thank you. My name is Ayo Obe. Um, you have my biography in the speakers list, but for the purposes of this, I think it's best to say that I'm a trustee of an educational NGO, which is the ZODBA's Way Memorial Libraries in Nigeria. Um, the rest, you'll be wondering why I'm here, because I'm not an educationist, or I think I'm past the age of learning too. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Ayo. Thank you very much indeed. Martha, let me go to part one. And part one, colleagues, of the debate is, are we really serious about young people being listened to in the shaping and influencing of their learning? Let me just ask you that question, but preface it by saying everybody now talks about the importance for learners to be fully engaged, that their motivation is connected to their emotion, that if they're emotionally involved and they've got the opportunity to participate, the poll that is associated 
itself with our debate this morning makes it very clear. Overwhelmingly, people say that we should increase the opportunities for young people's participation, active involvement in their learning. Everybody talks about personalisation of learning now, so that all young people's needs are met. We're involving young people in their learning seriously. Are we? Um, I think um, learners are not that much involved in decision making um, on what they want to do in like to study. I'll take an example of myself. I'm a graduate of law. Uh, I didn't want to do law, but because the system of education in my country, Tanzania, you just get to suggest what you want to study, but opportunities are so limited. So you are selected to go and um, study a course that you get an opportunity to go to university. So when I got an opportunity to do law, I took it, not because I love law, it's because I have to be in university. So now I've finished with um, bachelor's of law, but my passion is in uh, sociology, community development. I'm left wondering what I should do next, because now I, ha I have graduated in law, but I don't want to do laws. I want to do sociology. So it's a confusion when you don't listen to Elena. And let me just ask you, in terms of your early experience, were there opportunities for you, apart from some restrictions on what program, what course of study that you took, were there other opportunities for you to be engaged and participating actively in your school, or was that limited? Uh, it was limited. You don't get to be engaged um, completely. For example, I'll take, uh, an, um, I'll take a simple example. When you have to close um, a school, maybe um, there's a problem in a school and you have to close it, a teacher will come and tell you, we are going to close a school maybe for one month due to some problems. Then he'll say, now we are going to take classes on Saturday and Sunday. As a learner, I'll feel like, okay, do I really have to, to, to take classes on, on Sundays and uh, Saturdays? I won't feel like I have to do it, but if I was involved like in a yeah. group discussion, if an educator, like a teacher comes and say, you see we are closing school, and what do you think? How should we do it so that we finish the curriculum? And um, we discuss as learner and come up with an idea of how it should be done then I'll feel more involved and I'll feel like I have ownership of that, of what I'm doing. So I'll give it my all more than being enforced. I want to come back to you later and ask you the question about what you are seeing now as a wise learner as you travel around other countries. But I'll return to that. Oh, let me come to you. Um, I know that um, as a lawyer, um, as a, a human rights leader, uh, you see the connection between education and society, um, but you also see it um, more immediately because you're also a mother. Uh, and I know that you're also now leading the establishment of online learning materials for young people. So do you think, from what you are witnessing and your own involvement, that we have understood that young people really do need to be listened to? Um, thank you, Tony. Pausing only to express my astonishment at Martha's dislike for the law, which is <laughs> shared by my own daughter, I have to confess. I, I would say that um, we have the idea, we have the concept in our minds, but in actual practice, we, um, I think we do a lot more lip service. I yeah. mean, in the example that Martha gave, I think that the school authorities have a goal that they want to get to. And um, it's easier to say, but we, we consulted with the students. Even if in the meeting, um, the students don't come up with the solutions that the university authorities had wanted to impl implement, they would still say, but we consulted and we um, took their views into account. Which is not to say that they are not, um, that some authorities are not listening. Um, but I think that the problem perhaps now is that many school authorities don't really know how to go beyond the formality of consultation to the reality of it. Um, for example, in Nigeria, um, at the end of the day, the students have to meet up with the demands of the national curriculum. 
and they have to pass their exams. And so however much you want to consult the students about course content and all the rest of it, unless the student's voice is being heard and being filtered back to those who design the national curriculum, which in Nigeria's case may take um, several years to, to implement or to amend, unless they are actually feeding back about what they're learning, I think you may not get that. Um, in the online um, community, I think, however, students have much more control of what, what they can do. I mean, we just try to make the materials available and also to perhaps direct them away from the sort of glamour and, and entertainment and celebrity um, side of the internet to the, the materials that they can use to, to, to learn themselves. And I think that once they have that, then with a bit of guidance, certainly, they do get further. They, they, do, um, they have more opportunity to direct their own course. I think we'll come back to the question about the power of an online uh, community in participation and contribution, not just as uh, receivers, but actually as co-producers of information. So I think this is going to be an important part of our debate. Um, Yatsik, uh, in, a, in a conversation that we had prior to the start of this debate this morning, you expressed quite strong views on this topic and I'm hoping you're going to be equally controversial now. Um, um, thank you for asking me and encouraging me to be controversial. <laughs> uh, and I think that we should ask young people from the very beginning to be controversial, to really express what they are thinking. Yeah. And, uh, to, and we need much more control over your own learning from the very beginning. Um, I ask my wife to draw a picture, and uh, if it's possible to show it now, the, the picture which represents a model of education which we have now. And, uh, and I think that this basic assumption that uh, we need to educate and to give young people certain information, and later we need to ch check if they possess them by giving them tests, for example. This is, uh, this is basically wrong. Uh, we need to much more focus from the very beginning what is interest of older young people and very young people, what they understand already, uh, what there are issues they are facing. And uh, this is all about teaching methods. If the teaching methods are putting the knowledge in the head of students, if teaching methods are to make them memorize, only learn to repeat what they have been taught, <laughs> and we, we are later satisfied if they are giving right answers, and not focus what is their motivation, what is th their world, what they are interested in, thinking, we are lost. So we need to much more focus on young people from the very beginning as a learners and use what we know how people are learning, how motivation is important, how previous concepts which they have in a head are important, how the question they, be, by, they ask themselves or they, they want to find out are important. So we, we have to start from this point and finish with this wrong, <laughs> Very nice picture, my wife did very good work. But, but something, we have to finish with this image of education. Um, I, let me ask you this. Um, in your own country, when you think about the school system and particularly how it is evolving now, do you support the view that even from the earliest age, we actively encourage young people to have greater control over their learning? So I, let me ask Ayo to see if she can respond to you there for a moment. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm torn, actually, because yeah. I, I, I know that um, in today's um, sort of mass media world, the celebrity culture is actually filling a lot of um, heads. And perhaps there's an age at the very young age where the celebrity issue does not cloud people's thinking. And then there's an age at which everybody wants to be a footballer or a pole dancer or some other um, thing. <laughs> and, well, I, I shouldn't say everybody. Let, let me not be... Uh, it, it, you're the yeah, controversial and we won't, one. We won't ask for people to indicate <laughs> but, which of those know, categories. The, the sort of idea of um, instant fame 
And um, so I think that if you, if you can get young people at the youngest age, strangely enough, at the time when one thinks they don't know anything, then you can, um, they can have more, 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 more realistic, I don't, when I say realistic, I don't mean that they shouldn't aim for the top, just that they can also have ambitions about the things that don't look like instant fame. And so I would say that um, they're like, as in everything, being a cautious lawyer, my answer is um, both yes and no. I can see both sides of, of, of the argument in, in short. Yes, you do need to involve young people, but you have to give them the foundation on which they are going to make um, choices which are relevant to themselves. Let me open this up. Um, can people indicate if they'd like to come in and join the debate? All right, thank you very much. Um, my name is Alan Pell. I come from Estonia originally, um, but for the past three years I've worked as a student representative in higher education. Last year I was the chairperson of the European Students' Union, which is the biggest umbrella organization for higher education students in Europe. Now, um, what I, I, I completely agree with most of the things that have been said uh, at the moment right now, and one of the things that I've been very much struggling uh, we've been looking at how um, higher education is shaping uh, up in the modern world, and it's very fastly changing. And we can say that higher education, in higher education, things are certainly different from, from other levels. But higher education um, is especially crucial because one of the most important uh, developments in the entire education system takes place there, which is, uh, oh, partly it's of course research related, but another part is of course teacher training. And we've been working in around the concept of um, student-centered learning models. Um, deep learning, active learning, what do you need to change in the learning environment uh, in terms of how, how to change that. And it's, it has saddened me quite a bit that, and to answer your original question, that I don't think that there is much consideration at least from a European perspective, in most European countries, uh, towards what the students are actually uh, wanting to do. And I think the problem is partly in the students themselves. Um, I think that the, the, the mindset that is being instilled into the students comes from the previous levels of education. Yeah. And that is the most fundamental challenge because in almost all of our uh, K-12 systems, the values there that are put into the students' minds are order, that you have to listen to the authority, and you, you have to repeat what was said, and it's the regurgitation of knowledge. It's not you know, processing it through from your own perspective. And so in higher education, um, we often deal with um, solving this kind of a problem. But teacher training is something in which we can change where, where we come to the thing. So I would like to ask Okay. Your perspective on teacher training. Thank you very much. Let me go to the second question. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Matar Balde. I am from the Gambia in West Africa. Um, <coughs> and I think the discussion here is very interesting. <coughs> my concern is if we reflect back as young children, all of us here, how we learned from our parents how our parents really taught us, you know, from day one, to talk, to walk, you know, and <clears throat> eventually to learn the values in our society. How can we really, you know, <clears throat> bring this um, kind of learning into the classroom and make young people, you know, learn better? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take one more. Yes, John, just, just hold it a bit closer. Yeah, I'm Malak Zaluk from Egypt, and I direct uh, the Middle East Institute for Higher Education. Um, I'm just in, since I want to follow the, the mood of controversy, uh, so <laughs> just to follow on your steps, but I just want to make the distinction, very thin line, between student participation and, and really democratizing the, the whole education system and commoditizing education, meaning becoming far too customer oriented. And, and you know, where do you draw the line? Are we going to cater to students who want good grades for little work, or 
are we really talking about students who are really capable of assessing uh, and what does it take for a citizen to really assess the service they're getting? Thank you. Thank you. Let me come to the panel. So you've got three points being expressed here. Is there the danger that our early experience just simply means that we don't really become the powerful learner we should be? Is there the danger that we have lost the kind of informal learning environment that our parents encouraged us to participate in? some parents perhaps, and is there a danger of the too responsive to the consumer? Yeah. Martha, have a go. What I think is, uh, as the society is changing, education is also changing. So at that particular time during the um, early societies, there was a way of educating people that was fitting to that particular society at that particular time. Now the society is changing, and we also need to address the way we educate young people. For example, right now we have the media, social media. Young people are more engaged in social media. How are we going to collaborate that to, to, to educate our children? So if we want to, like, if we want to work with the, um, if we want to educate our our children, the way we educated them in the early society is going to be difficult because now we have to educate um, a student to fit in this society. So what I should say is we have to move ahead with the society, the technology, and um, we shouldn't like look back to the early society because that time is past. Yatsa, come in. Um. I, I think that uh, I would refer to this uh, need for better training of teachers. And uh, there is hope that we will train future t teachers in a better way. But I, I think that crucial question is what to do with existing teachers, because th this is how sh school is functioning already. And new teachers would learn from previous teachers what to do in classrooms. So it really is question, key question is in service training. And um, uh, I think that we can do a lot about it. Uh, uh, and it, it's, it's already happening. Uh, there are a lot of approaches when teachers trying to be responsible to each other, watch each other how we, we taught. And idea of deprivatization of teaching and learning, so showing uh, how teaching and learning is going in a classroom. And working together how to improve this, this method is very key. I would just, as you think about the response to the questions, let me give you two more comments that have come through the Twitter feed. One is, where and how do you draw the line between asking a five-year-old about their interests and choosing what's best for them? Your very point. And this is your opportunity to give advice to educators. How can we make it easier for leaders to move past formalities and make collaboration with students more meaningful? Well, I, I, I'm reminded actually of a time when I went to, um, to South Africa and the teacher there, or I watched a program where it was said that the job of the teacher is not to be the sage on the stage, but the guide at the side, which sounds very good, but also actually to me still tends to capture the idea. But I think that, especially coming from Nigeria, the, and, and, and this goes to the issue of the gentleman from Estonia and from the Gambia, the, the, the status of teachers in Nigeria is, is a real problem. I mean, when you talk about what do we do with the existing teachers, I think we have to do what we can to raise their status beyond... Um, I mean, at the moment, it's when you don't get into the first courses in a Nigerian university that they then send you to... Um, uh, for example, you wanted to study English. You don't get into the English course. They send you to English education. And um, so already you're kind of being um, socialised to know that you are second best. And I, actually, I must say that I appreciate one thing about coming to um, WISE is that it puts, um, in a way, it makes 
it elevates the profession back to what it, it, it perhaps ought to be from all those um, nasty jabs that people used to um, give. But I think also it speaks to the fact that we learn from our parents because they were the gods in our world. Um, we, we, learned, we, we copied them, in short. Our teachers are not necessarily, I'm not saying they have to be gods in our world, but they have to be people that we want to look up to so that we want to see how they do things. But if the teacher themselves is not feeling that um, sense of importance, then it's gone. And it, this is certainly a problem in my part of the world. We used to have a program called the Village Headmaster, which was very popular. And the Village Headmaster was um, you know, the, the innovator, the bringer of new ideas, the person that was looked up to in the society. Um, troublemaker, of course, but still you know, somebody who, who had status. And that status is definitely gone. So I think that one thing that we really need to do is to raise the status of teachers. And if that means paying them more, uh, you know, it's good to have nice buildings. But yes, we, 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 have to, we have to pay them more. Because even the private schools in Nigeria are finding it difficult now to recruit teachers who, with whom the parents, who are paying a lot of money for education, feel comfortable. I know I've got others who are going to come in, and I will come back and make sure that you do. But I want to move on to part two uh, of uh, the debate. And I want to pick up, I hope, both on your earlier point about your work in the online environment and, Martha, your point about social media and its power. Let me, let me try and put this in really stark terms. There are those who will argue that if schools and schooling cannot engage young people more actively, young people will bypass the schools. In other words, that the shift of power to young people in a changing society and changing globe is a given. It's not something that you can either choose to have or not to have, and it's enabled by the technology. So if schools don't know how to harness technology, to support greater engagement of young people, young people will learn and act in an online environment with the help of social media and they will move into society as active people but not necessarily through the support or the education or the preparation of their schools. So let me just go to Yatsik and say, is this a danger? I, I think that is some some hopes that technology or which are so wonderful can save our school by themselves. My point would be that you need first to focus on better teaching, just respecting students. And if you respect students, you just let them to use technology which is available. And so first respect them, later led them to use <laughs> what is available, yeah. Well, okay, so it's got potential. But, Martha, what's your sense? Um, will young people grow increasingly impatient and therefore they'll simply take matters into their own hands? Um, what I think, if technology is not used in schools, um, students will stay in school, they'll go to class, right. they will learn yep. just because they have to. And at the end of the day, they have to, to look for better jobs in the future. So I'm just going to school to learn and get a better job in the future. But what I think is um, educators, teachers, should, should use technology as a tool to educate students. For example, many students today are using Twitter. They're using Facebook and LinkedIn. So if educators, teachers follow them in those um, social media, and use them to, um, to teach them more, then it's going to be very helpful. I'll give an example of um, one of the learners today when we are coming to the, bar, um, to, to, the, to the conference. He said in his class, the teacher decided to use Twitter, as in um, when he's teaching, the background is um, tweets um, passing by. And what they do is, why, why did he do that? It's because there are other students who just do not want to answer questions or to collaborate in the class. But if they use Twitter, it means 
if a student is listening and he did not understand something in the class, he can just tweet it and the teacher will see it on the, on the board and ask the question, okay, somebody say this, what do you say? Then all the students are engaged. So I think technology should be really used and, yep. And if not, then you're saying young people will still attend schools. Yes. But they'll be hardly there in terms of their engagement. They'll simply serve time in order to get the credential to then move on, but the real engagement will come from elsewhere. But the power of technology is to engage young people in classrooms, in schools, yeah? Yes. Um, oh, what, what's your view here? Because you've talked about the potential of your own work in the education space. I think, um, let me say that, it, in a way it's difficult for me because I'm a member of the baby boomer generation that didn't go to university to get a job, and it speaks to this issue about, you know, training to the demands of the computer. So that one went through school because one, but one didn't feel that one was staying there in order to be able to be employed. Right. And I think that part of the, and I mean, it's a certainty that the jobs that people will be doing in the future are not necessarily the jobs that we even know the titles of. I mean, that's probably been true for the past 10 or 20 years. But it's even, um, it's, it's even more... I mean, my daughter is, um, just like Martha, a, a fresh law, law graduate. Um, and she's teaching in a school where, quite frankly, even to have the textbook... I mean, she's doing her youth service, which is something you have to do after you graduate in Nigeria. But to even have the, the book that she's supposed to be teaching the students is a problem. The issue of having access to the internet to be able to tweet... And, and so on, is probably not going to be the immediate method of communication for most um, students in, in a country in Nigeria, certainly not in the, in the public sector. And I do recognize that there's a growing gulf in my country between what's available in the private sector and what's available in the public sector. And that's actually why we try to make resources available online, because we don't just want to provide computers. I mean, anybody can put computers into school, but what we're trying to develop on our website is actual material that can open doors to, um, to children. So that, yes, the teachers themselves may also go there. I mean, I was looking at it the other just um, recently, and I was thinking, I might try and learn Spanish through this thing, which is actually for, for, for five-year-olds or 10-year-olds. But, you know, the teachers themselves can also access information, and just open doors to students. I think that's really yeah. what, what it's about. But, also, but, but, but just that act of opening doors is a way of saying, besides what Kim Kardashian is up to, there are other things you know, that you might want to follow on Twitter and that you might want to, um, you know, to, to, to think about. And, and just as a child having access to ordinary, to ordinary encyclopedias, you would just flip open the book and you would start reading about astronomy. I'm not sure how that happens now in a virtual world, whether you just sort of get lucky. Um, but if you don't have um, real books and you, your access to virtual books is dependent on an erratic electricity supply, you, you really are... Um, mm being constrained. So even though we are certainly trying to make online resources available, we certainly don't um, in any way disregard or um, denigrate the old-fashioned, you know, piece of paper. Um, my name is uh, Rifat Sabah. I am the president of the Arab Campaign for Education for All, as well as I am the director of the Teacher Creative Center in Palestine. Uh, uh, my comment is not a question, it's a comment. For me, learning must be geared towards the needs of the country. Education cannot just be a question of bureaucracy, cannot be just a bureaucracy, a chain of formalities. Compulsory uh, curricula where you can't innovate, where you have no leeway for innovation. 
there is no teaching if there is no freedom of expression where young teachers can innovate uh, uh, and, and the state through its bureaucracy cannot prevent it. Uh, uh, where good practices uh, uh, should be shared by the teachers. So we, we need a radical change in the method of uh, learning and teaching. We must therefore create mechanisms to actually benefit from all these innovations, and we must change mindsets. Decision makers must accept innovation. Thank you very much. And in fact, I'm going to come back to precisely that question in part three. My name is Chris Charlson. I'm a head of a, a school in Qatar. I've been involved with international education for a long time. Um, Mark Twain famously said he, he never let schooling get in the way of a good education. Um, in our world now, we have huge um, open source resources for education on the internet. We have the phenomenon of a technology leapfrog, where countries have bypassed telephone systems and, and smartphones are in the hands of many people. And Uganda is quite a good example of that, yeah. where mobile technology is pr proliferating. Putting all those things together is a real challenge for educators. And my question is, uh, Students are voting with their, their fingers. They are um, not accepting what is happening, either by government, governments or by schools. And they are using these tremendous open source online education resources to educate themselves. We need to accept that that is part of what digital natives are doing. And how can we incorporate that into the education that we provide for young people. Thank you. I will just first say that the real challenge is not for young people finding their own creative ways of learning informally from Twitter, Facebook, open source. That is given. Yeah. We shouldn't even bother about it. Yeah. The real question is systemic. We are financing the largest service system in the world by tax money, which is education. Yes. The question is, how, what innovation can we do to make a structural adjustment in the construct of education delivery that will intrinsically allow, stimulate, promote young people's engagement in their learning, shaping their learning as competent partners, OK? And I will just t uh, say a couple of words about that. The case for engagement is so clear. It is so crystal clear, you can't even hide it. First, it is a right. Children have a right, the International Convention on the Rights of a Child for Engagement. Two, they are customers of the largest service system in the world. Abu Mazen in Palestine, Clinton, Coca-Cola, everybody worries about customer satisfaction. How come education is the one exception in the universe? And in fact, it's even worse. Students are forced to consume the commodity for seven hours along 12 formative years of their life, and they can say nothing about what they learn, how they learn, from whom they learn, and what nothing. They just sit there. Four, we know now from neuroscience research that engagement is a fundamental enabler for learning. So it even raises the effectiveness and efficacy of the investment because students who are engaged are more able to learn effectively, and instead of being in class, are not there, spaced out. Mm. And hence, you know, you're losing money. You know? mm. And uh, fourth is that um, uh, the, the, uh, the issue of collaboration that is mentioned as a kind of banner for the conference, I truly believe that we need to come to terms with thinking of children as our primary partners, they're partners, they're comp they can, you know? So to my mind, I mean, that what is missing is a systemic, effective toolkit approach for tapping on their voices. Let me give you one minor example. Just one. One, one example, I promise. 
you say, I am going to put $5 billion in teacher training yeah. to do such and such. And you hope that, wow, by the inputs you have done, syllabus, everything, tamam, kulshi, perfect. But the question is, you're missing the point. The whole matter is about the center, the locus of the operation is the child. If you don't listen to him, what he has to say about your investment, you're missing the point. So we need to have a systemic approach whereby the feedback of the student systematically tells us how well our investment is doing education, be it you know, bullying, psychosocial, personalization, yes. whatever. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, Basarat Kazim, I'm here from Pakistan. I've been working uh, in the nonprofit sector in education for the past 33 years. Uh, basically, I want to also talk about the exam system. What are we doing? Because uh, children are learning uh, in very different ways now. Technology cannot be kept back. It cannot even be kept back from those rural schools that have almost uh, you know, no resources and uh, very little um, electricity too. Children are still using computers there. But the exam system is a dampener. And the education mafia that is created around the exam system uh, is what really gets children down. So what do we do about that or how do we think about that? Okay, let me come back to the panel. And I want to pick up two points in particular, but you will respond as you see fit. One, I think, is the challenge that we have to think about uh, what is in the best interest of the nation, the country, um, and the argument that we'll need to ensure that we have innovation and creativity and more and more young people able to learn effectively. And the argument here that unless we make some structural change, we'll never get change at scale, even if we remove things like examination systems. So, Martha, come in and tell me what you think might be the way of really moving forward here. Um. I think I'll, I'll touch some elements of uh, uh, the question from the gentleman and the lady. Yes. Um, I think the first thing we should um, redefine education. Um, what do we want uh, to do with education? Do we want to uh, education to be a factory to produce um, a working class to fit in certain organizations, um, certain working um, places? Or do we want to have um, people, potential people, to fit in the society, doing the right thing in the society? If we want to, like, to uh, education to be a factory to produce people to go work in certain organizations, certain industries, then we can keep on like um, evaluating students using the normal exams that we have. Like, okay, this student has performed math mathematics very well. Excellent, he should go to, to a very good university, he should go to Harvard. This one has failed, then okay, he should remain at home, he can't do anything. But you find um, there are students who do not really do well in certain subjects, but they are very potential at other skills, maybe vocational training, they can do music, which is an industry that is really growing. They can do acting, there are very many th things that students can do and are very potential in, which when they are like when they are taught, when they are trained to do, they can be best even more than those we call intellectual in maybe mathematics, history, and geography. So I think we should rethink what really education needs to deliver. And uh, as you come in, I think that's what you were saying before, that in fact it's a changing world. So if you want to produce young people for outdated jobs, mm -hmm. keep doing what you're doing. But as you pointed out, we're talking about new opportunities for young people to create their own futures, to think about self-made entrepreneurial opportunities that they themselves want to pursue. We're not going to be looking at an economy where people are trained for existing jobs. I, I agree, and I would also add that we act as if it's last chance saloon. Yeah. You go through school, and once you didn't do whatever you were, um, you, you aim to do, that's the end of your life, you know, close it, finish. And yet we're living in a world where, you know, absent certain um, catastrophes, life expectancy is increasing. And yet we want to cram everything 
into um, you know this short period, and I mean my own sister, who I mean she's older than me, but she she dropped out of school and then she decided. Now I want to go and do my A-levels. Now I want to go to university. So she's, she's the one that has the doctorate in our family. Whereas I just did everything at the expected stage. So you, and, and yet I've had to learn to do new things and to, to, to keep up or to just follow an interest, yeah. to pursue a concern. So and this I is think genuinely that, lifelong learning. Yes. The so idea I think that, yeah, that, yeah I, I, I think I was lying when I said that I've stopped, I've passed the age of learning. Because actually, I think that we, a, a young person, and, and one, 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 one wants to assume that, yes, we don't have schools just because we can't think of what else to do with young people, because we certainly know that some are put out to work. So there are other things that we can do with young people besides sending them to school. So we should, as the gentleman said, make the most of it. But as the other gentleman from um, Palestine said, I, I wonder who determines what the needs of the nation are. I mean, because the decisions are being, if they're being made at the political sphere, they're generally being made by people uh, probably a bit younger than I am, you know, in their 40s or, or even in their, their 30s. But they're not being made by the people who are actually going to live the results of those, um, those decisions. So I wonder again, when we say what the nation needs, in the end, yes, you may say there are certain things that the nation needs, but there should always be room for flexibility and for people to decide that, well, whatever the nation needs, I'm going to you know, do my own thing. Because you never know. I mean, I don't want to use the cliche of Bill Gates, but here I am using it. Um, you know, you may end up doing something completely different. Yeah. Point of phrase. <laughs> I'm going to come back to Martha in a moment. Yasek, I want to ask you this because um, you'll have a response to what you've heard. There are at least two or three tweets here that say we have to avoid just tweaking existing systems, the structural change point. But there are others who are saying, but teachers, teacher training, teachers who put young people at the centre are the change agents. So the possibility of being able to shift into a place where young people are learning in different ways. You talk about inquiry-based, problem-solving, formative assessment. So your view would be that we do know how to go about getting the shift. Yes, I think that if we remove some kind of rigidity from the bureaucratic structure, it was just in the question, uh, yeah. you questioned this, from OTS questioned this bureaucratic uh, structure there would be much more place for students do like project-based learning uh, in which you would have a lot of uh, they would have their voice would be heard uh, it would be po possible to do it a, a, according what there is interest and strength and for this we need to change how teachers are working we need to change um, how in service training, what was said before, yes. is organized. And we need to remove the examination system, the power of examination system, which really press education down. Martha, you want to come back in? Um, I just wanted to add a point. I think also in, in the teachers' training, teachers play a greater role in the education system. As if you have well-trained teacher, then the product even of the student is really good. I have an example in Tanzania. We have um, a university called Sokoine University of Agriculture. Students there are trained um, in agriculture system, how things work. Amazingly, these students, after they complete their, um, their studies, they go apply um, to do other works like bank tellers, are uh, other social media, while in Tanzania, the land is so vast. You know, we have plenty of land, which if this um, student were really well trained, they'll go and um, work in this land and be very productive. But since they're not well trained, they're not even told the purpose they're there in the University of Agriculture, how they can be productive in the nation. Then this, um, this potential in these young people is lost. So I think also teachers play a really greater role in educating um, students. Okay, colleagues, can I move us on to part three? I, I just wanted to say, um, because when um, Yashik was saying that 
the, the tyranny of the education system. I'm, I'm reminded of, of, the, of the exam system. I'm reminded of this um, person, whenever it was suggested that we should abolish exams, he said, starting with airline pilots and brain surgeons. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yes. We do want technical expertise when we're in the air or on the operating table. Correct. Uh, by the way, there are, there are a number of tweets here that were suggesting, and I'll come back, I'll come back in one moment, that are suggesting we're not going far enough. So I'm just going to let you know that there are those who would like um, us to be a little more radical. So we've got the argument here that some of the conversation is pulling us back from a radical rethink of education. There are some who are saying to us, education and technology doesn't equal transformation. And uh, there are others who are saying that we are underestimating the power of social media to improve education because it can connect us nationally and globally and locally and break down barriers. Now, let me just ask you this question about one of the objectives of this debate was to go to the next level. Gatsik, we have got a sense here that even if we place young people at the centre of learning and we engage them more, and if we can enrol and harness technology, there's no guarantee that we will be fully educating young people to be global citizens for the common good. Now, you have worked for decades to ensure that it's not just engagement for engagement's sake, or it's not just technology for greater connectivity, there's got to be, in your mind, a purpose for doing this. Now, it's been raised in a couple of ways, I think, this morning already. But your argument is that you want to ensure that what we do produces active and informed citizens. So I want to ask you, do you think we are going far enough in the way in which this debate is unfolding? And would you ask us to be much more, as you were in a phase of your life, much more activist, seriously wanting to ensure young people become not just informed, but very active for the common good? Mm -hmm. um, I believe very much that if young people don't have opportunities, why they are young, to do some, something socially important, something in your, for life or their, uh, their family or their local community, they would be powerless later and they would be passive in their life. So we need, while they are at school, give them opportunity to really be change agents, to really do something for, for others, for themselves, and this is the question of asking question, uh, about listening student voice. So we need to listen to them, allow them to be active, and also uh, give them opportunities to change the world around them. I think that we not, we, the education is not set up really, uh, it's even going against uh, uh, encouraging activism of young people. It's more set up like building passivity. And uh, we have to find a way to really uh, somehow uh, change this. But their countries have different values, different traditions, different cultures, different mm -hmm. expectations. So what if a nation says, we don't want to actively encourage our young people to be activists, to be changing the social order? What do you say then? Um, of, of, of course, no, we, we, can, we, can, we can stop this in some way or trying to stop. This is what we are doing a lot of times as education. Uh, but if we really respect young people, and I, I think that every teacher, every parent respect young people, so we would think about them. And we know that without their activism, we wouldn't tackle global issue. So we need m much more radical thinking. We need... We need problem solver, young people to be problem solver. So we need to give them problems and we need to respect them when they are recognizing problems to uh, like, let them work on it. Well, Martha, you are now a wise learner and you are encouraged to be an advocate for change, global change. Part of the responsibility you've taken on is to promote some quite serious change. How do you feel about this? 
I, I really feel good because um, with uh, joining the Lena's Voice program, I feel like my voice is more heard. As I, I, I sit here today, I've expressed, um, I have expressed my ideas and what I think is right. And um, having all uh, the change makers, innovators, um, policy makers here, I feel like there's something that has to be changed in an uh, in education system. And uh, I should call upon everyone here to, to engage in, um, in changing the education system in their local areas. So uh, your, your work in the civil rights area would be a perfect example of why you would want young people to become responsible global citizens and to be activist? But I, I think young people, uh, I, I must confess that I'm not very much of an ageist and I always sometimes find it dif even difficult to know how old people are. So I, I wouldn't um, necessarily say young people or, or, or old people. I, I would just right. say that I think that people are, are going to, they, they need to be activists, they need to be involved in their own lives. And I think that there are stages where you will try it and there are stages where you will not try it. I'm not an educator. And I think that sometimes what we call, I mean, speaking as a parent who, you know, decides um, this is a school that I want my, my, my child to go to, the parent who goes to the parent teacher association meetings or the, the, the open days and discusses what is going on in the child's education. I think that, um, it may be that there's a discussion. Sometimes there's a back discussion with a child, but often it's actually the parent who is the interlocutor with the, um, with the school. And I, I still find myself wondering, and, and it's a bit difficult to say this because this is a summit about innovation, whereas you know the thing about lawyers is that we, we do nothing that hasn't been done before, for which there's no precedent. And, um, but sometimes I think that we we run the risk of reinventing a wheel which was already there, but we have decided that we don't need to know about history and therefore we, um, we need not learn these lessons. And I just think that in the end, there are only so many subjects that can be taught in, uh, in a school and there are only so many um, doors that can be opened. But I think the important thing is to open the doors to the, um, to the students and not to... I, I mean, I, I think, yes, it is important for young people to realise as much of their potential as they can when they're young. But I didn't become the um, president of the Civil Liberties Organisation until I was in my 40s. So I think that there's no point at which... And, and then I had to learn all the... I didn't even know what an NGO meant, quite frankly, and I had to learn all of that. So I think that there is... Um, it, it's important that we don't say that because you didn't pass the hurdle, you can't run around it and get, to get back onto the same track. Because otherwise, a young person would end up feeling almost a sense of panic. That if I don't make it now, I haven't, I've got to make a decision. I've got to decide, am I going to be a doctor? Am I going to be a computer scientist? Am I going to write programs? And, you know, one almost wants to say, calm down. It's okay. You know. Take your time. I know that employers will look at your resume and say, oh, there's a gap here. You seem to have taken time off and loafed around. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> it's not a federal offence. I know that the, the job market is very important, particularly in times of rising unemployment. But I think that at the same time, as I said, we should, um, we should chill. <laughs> yeah, I think that this is very interesting that, in fact, there is a lifelong path here for learning. And we should remember that the schooling is one phase of that. It's interesting that others are, I think, responding to your point. Um, the question about engaged learners only, well, certainly what about parents and guardians? And others have said, learning is everybody's business. This is not just about schools. This is about corporates and not-for-profits and philanthropists and social entrepreneurs all need to be in this game. Okay, let me open this up. Good morning, I'm Ponce from the Philippines. I'm a wise learner just like Martha. Just very three uh, quick three things. Um, first, I agree with um, Mr. Yatsek about, about respect. Um, some of the wise learners were threatened to, to 
fail their courses by their professors for coming here. And I think for, for an opportunity to, to learn like this, and I think they, they don't respect and they don't take into account what's really best for, for the students. Um, secondly, about the needs uh, of the nation, there's this quote that says, don't ask what the world needs, do and study what makes you come alive, because what the world needs are people who have come alive. And I think um, I wouldn't trust Martha to be my lawyer if I go to jail, because she doesn't <laughs> love what she does. But she's my friend. Uh, so, and um, last thing, the Learner's Voice, uh, we are launching a, a mini campaign while we're here because we believe that collaborating for change means collaborating with the learners. And we, we, we invite you to pledge a commitment um, with your organization to increase collaboration with learners. Please approach our booth and tweet, um, I'm with hashtag wise learners. I will pledge to do this. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. My name is Fatou Matali. I'm from the uh, uh, National Commission for Senegalese UNESCO, but I'm a teacher. I've been teaching for the past 25 years. So uh, I'd like to say that the uh, solution to me would be to create an osmosis between school and life. You know, it's fundamental that the child needs to uh, to find his or her values in what he or she learns at school. But in order to do that, you need motivation. You need to motivate people to build that knowledge. But that motivation would also, uh, most and foremost, come from the teachers. Because teaching is, uh, no, we have to say so, and, uh, for a very long time, teaching meant not innovating. It only meant uh, simply saying uh, what was in the books, but more and more we're going towards innovation. So that's why I think we need to create that osmosis between schools and the pupils' lives and the teachers' lives, as I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I just, as we go across to uh, this side of the room, can I let you know, colleagues, that uh, a number of people agree that we should chill. People are wanting to do that. And others are saying that um, there's the possibility that we are dreaming that a number of education systems are explicitly designed to be innovation averse and they've got no interest in transformation at all. So I'll just add these comments as we go along. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Amal Buzaineddin. I come from the American University of Beirut, uh, Lebanon. And I've been listening to the comments and to the panelists, and I'm, I'm thinking, are we talking about whose voice is louder, the teacher's voice or the learner's voice? And I'm thinking of education, and I agree with you, Martha, probably each should go back to his her context of, of education and redefine what education is in their context, because as far as I'm concerned, and I come from the education department, schools are learning communities. And learning communities meaning it's all of us are learning from each other. Teachers learning from students, students learning from teachers, yep. teachers, students learning from the community, the community learning from the, from the school. And I, I can see not only project-based and, and problem-based learning in schools, I can see community-based learning in schools, which would get learners, I hope, to become activists, not pass pacifists, activists in the meaning of social change, not necessarily political change. Thank you. Thank you. Anish uh, from India, been working uh, in a marketing profile for the last one and a half years. So probably I'll be speaking more from my experience as a student. Uh, two quick questions. Firstly, I've always wondered why is it that most systems would restrict a fifth grader from you know, doing sixth grade mathematics? If, if he shows the inclination and the aptitude, then why should the system hold him back? So that's my first question. Secondly, uh, it's just a thought. I hope some of you would uh, help me build on it. Um, are there instances where students have been provided an illusion of choice to actually better engage with them? So instead of telling the third grader that you know, you'll need to do third grade mathematics this year, I ask him, 
Okay, so in the first semester, would you like to do third grade algebra or third grade geometry or third grade calculus or something like that? So other instances where we're actually giving illusions of choices, we know what's best for the students broadly. We still want to hear them. We still want to get their inputs, but we are still actually, you know, helping, help, engaging with them to, you know, do the whole loop. Yeah, it's not genuine. Yeah, that's great. Let me get three over here. If I can take the microphone right up the back first. Thank you. And then I'll get the microphone down here. Okay. I'm Carolyn Anyanueva. I'm from UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning. And I just want to say this education society and Can learners, you just stand up because okay. we'll get a better okay. sound in the room. Uh, Thank you. These are three big words, education, learners, and, edu and um, society. No, but let me focus on learning because, in fact, we are learning differently now thanks to technology. When you look at young children and young people, it's like simultaneous learning. And there is a book by Nicholas Carr on Fal uh, Shallows, which say that, in fact, we are not learning as profoundly as we are. Not like everybody now is tweeting. And the question is, given this learning process, which is very new, are the teachers ready to engage in such learning process? Now, so I think the question of who are we talking about, the teachers or the learners, it's both. Now, and our challenge is that in our world today, our teachers are not as trained, so many teachers are not as trained to engage in such kind of learning. No? Thank you. Okay, Stephen Harris from the Sydney Centre for Innovation and Learning. Um, but a comment and question relating to my experience in Rwanda. Um, I've got a project where I work in northern Rwanda. What's spinning my mind at the moment and listening to this conversation is uh, contexts now where, where kids from highly impoverished situations, i.e. living subsistence farming, um, have managed through contact with different programs to get uh, onto Twitter, onto emails, and they're actually bypassing their school, bypassing NGOs, they're bypassing World Vision, they're bypassing other places and sending direct messages to sort of say, you know, I'm, I'm desperate to learn English, can, can you connect me up in, in different ways? Now, I guess what I'm seeing there is we're, we're so far behind in our understanding of what's actually happening because you're talking about kids here who, if they've earned... Uh, you know, hardly any money, they're not spending it on food or on, on anything else for themselves. They're actually going down 10 kilometres to a marketplace and, and buying 10 minutes of email time as the way in which they spend their money. Now, the world is not responding to that need or that change fast enough because they can see suddenly that the ceiling of opportunity is opening up because they can jump past their school, they can jump past everything in their life. Now, it's what, what are we going to do about that, I guess, as a society? Thank you, Steve. Can you pass the microphone just here? Good work. And then I'm going to come back. OK. Hi. My name is uh, Tom Whitby. I've been a classroom educator for 40 years. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor now uh, in a school in New York where we, we teach teachers. Uh, so I've run the gamut of everything. And, and We've talked about 20 or 30 different things that are really affecting education today. It's not just one thing. And there are so many, so many problems that, that are just not being addressed. But one of the things that, that we are starting to see as connected educators, because more and more educators are connecting online today. Uh, we've got teachers connected through Twitter. We've got teachers connected through LinkedIn. Um, we're collaborating more. We're understanding <clears throat> the bigger picture. Um, we're, we're comparing notes. And, and through technology, we're seeing education changing because we can get into creation, we can get into collaboration, we can get into communicating in ways that we've never been able to do before. But I do believe that we need to educate the educators because they are really going to bring the, the change that we need. We need to be better learners ourselves in order to be better educators. The, the other point that I wanted to make which I totally forgot since I stood up here. Um, we need to, to get more educators connected. Uh, it's one of the things that, that, well, Steve Anderson is here. He's also uh, a connected educator. It's, it's what, what we push for. Um, in, in getting 
educators connected, we're getting a better understanding of where we should be going with this education. Okay, so last two. Yes. Thank you very much. And uh, Magdalena Nenemaido uh, from the National Commission for UNESCO, Federal Minister of Education, Nigeria, like <laughs> Madam Ayo. Uh, two things I want to talk about. First, for us to realize that there are still some societies that are still struggling with access to education and access to social media. That's one point. Then the second point I want to make is concerning the teacher. If we want the learner's voice to be heard, you have to get the teacher to understand that. Like uh, Ms. Sayot uh, said, some of our teachers are not even equipped for what we are talking about here. The best are not there, the best hands are not in the teaching profession. They need to be motivated, they need to be trained. In-service training is so key to it. And so if we want uh, us to have a connection between the teacher and the learner who is very much in the social media, for us to avoid a disconnect, the teacher has to be carried along. And so I want to lend my voice to the lady from UIL saying that the educator, the teacher needs to move along with what is happening now for, for us to get our, our learners to really have what they want to learn in school. Thank, Thank you. you. And finally. Hi, <laughs> my name is Barbara Barry. I'm from the United States. Um, one issue that I wanted to bring up that I didn't necessarily hear about is just the sheer amount of data and knowledge production that we're all producing and that's being encoded around the world right now. So each of us has a Twitter stream, maybe a Facebook account. Children as early as five and six years old are posting things on Instagram through their parents. So each of us has this trace of knowledge that we can encourage others to learn from. So we can be educators through that. And also teaching young children, I think especially, how to wayfind through all of that digital and encoded information is going to be a really important thing that we can do as educators. Colleagues, thank you for uh, fantastic contributions. I'm going to make it hard for the panel because I hope that you've been able to listen to those comments and questions. But I'm going to ask you to make one final comment yourselves. Yatsik, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to ask you this. You have committed a number of decades to establishing a highly successful centre for citizenship education. And your view of that is that it requires whole school change and whole system change to be able to get to the point that you think we need to have all young learners. Are you optimistic? Are we making progress? Have you heard stories here today that give you a sense that, yes, we are heading in the right direction globally? Um, I, I think that the quality of discussion about education is improving, generally, for three years. And um, the, now how we are focused on giving learner uh, voice to learners is heard all around. So we, we need this step to change bureaucratic system which stop this. But the, uh, the understanding what needs to, be, it needs to happen is very widely sp spread. Yes. I'm optimistic. You're optimistic. OK, I, uh, let me come to you. Because um, you started by saying I'm not an educator, but you did say at one point that I recognise that I am an ongoing continuous learner. And given that you've encouraged us just to take our time and be a little calm, um, Others have a real sense of urgency. So where do you sit between that sense of there is time to do this, but also an urgency amongst many people to say we have to transform our learning systems? Oh, I, I mean, I, I think that one, one should always have in mind that there's a possibility of doing something different. But you cannot put children into suspended animation while you work out what to do. So definitely there is a sense of urgency, particularly in countries where the population is growing and the, um, the, the resources that are being devoted to education are not and have not grown to meet the population. Certainly that was um, at the time when I was a child, the percentage of the national cake or whatever is going. I mean, yes, parents are putting in yes. what they can, but definitely one has to um, have a sense of, um, of urgency, simply because the 
investment that some parents are making in their own children's education can be wiped out in an instant if, they don't, if we don't understand that it is in fact a joint project, whether or not it's our, our, our own child. I would only say that I think that it's as if we're going down a corridor that we thought had an end. And the further we go down that corridor, we see more doors, we see that the corridor is ongoing yeah. and ongoing. And the important thing is to make sure that those doors can always be opened at any time by anybody. And that you can even open a door, pop in, and pop out again if you find that it doesn't. And, and I think that the role of teachers is to be there to reassure the student who wants to make their own choices that they have the validity to make those choices. The role of a teacher is a reaffirming role. It may not be that the teachers know everything. It's a cliche of nowadays that we all have to learn how to operate the, um, you know, the recorder on our televisions from our children and, and stuff. So we are learning a lot of things from the young. But it doesn't mean to say that the fact that we have understood that it is a two-way process means that the respect which underpins the relationship between a teacher and a pupil has to be um, discarded. But I think that the teacher can gain that respect if they show that, not that they are going to chase after every new butterfly of, of innovation, mm. perhaps, mm. but that they are open to new ideas and that they have the capacity to discern and, and to advise that this may be better or this may, may not. So I think that's what I'd say. Thank you. Martha, let me come to you finally and say, that, by the way, there's a Twitter uh, feed here that's suggesting that you can apply your legal, your law f degree to community development and a range of other things that people want you to do. Okay, so can you just note that? Can I just close by saying um, to you and ask you to respond? There's a sense in which this challenge is at the individual, the, the community level, the national and the global. You're operating at all of those levels. And this debate has been about education and society, listening to learners. There was a question about the politics of education. The Deputy Director General of UNESCO this morning made it clear that education is part of the global political agenda and you have been called upon and have agreed to act in ways that will transform learning. How are you feeling? Not much responsibility? Uh, it's a responsibility uh, to transform learning, but I would say it's a gradual process that uh, is not a one day uh, innovation. It has to, it's a process that has to go on. But again, uh, we should, uh, with the development in technology, we should always uh, know that, uh, we should always ask a question Does the teacher know everything? Because now students can go and uh, search for materials and also challenge their teachers. So it should be a collaboration that teachers should also listen to the students and students should also listen to their teachers to come up with the more concrete ideas um, to, to, to run the society. Well, collaboration is in fact the key of this year's WISE 2012 and that's a perfect point to end on because it's going to take all of our efforts young people, parents, teachers, leaders, the education systems, business, philanthropists, social entrepreneurs, everybody is going to be involved in taking us into a 21st century learning system that's going to be adequate to the global challenges that we have, the local challenges we have. So can I indicate in three ways that we are grateful for this debate. First, to those who have joined us on Twitter, thank you very much indeed for your questions. To all who have joined us here this morning in the debate, thank you for your participation. But would you at this point in closing the debate thank our three panel members very much indeed. Thank you very much.